Okay, so I had a friend who moved to Los Angeles for his lifelong goal of becoming a stand-up comedian. And he was there for about a year. Now his goal was to just stay there for the rest of his life. But it didn't work out that way. He moved back here. And I said, what was the reason? And he said, there's a different culture in Los Angeles. He said, every single person that I met looked at me as and evaluated whether or not I was a stepping stone for their career. And he said, that's considered normal there. So if you have somebody who is a friend, it means they can do something for you. They can get you a job at a club or they can help you uh, uh, enhance your material, things like that. So everybody is an it, not a person. You see, so it's I, it. Mm -hmm. Whereas if somebody is an I, thou, it means I have you as a friend because you're just like me. Now, I didn't think this idea up. It's from a theologian named Martin Buber. And he said, he came up with the idea because he said, how many people pray to a God? Because just like in Los Angeles, I want you to do this for me. I want you to do this for me. I want you to do this. See, mm -hmm. it's an it. <clears throat> and he said, imagine if you had a concept of God that you related to who could do nothing for you, but you still wanted it some kind of friendship. So I just applied that to this video series. What do you think of that? It's interesting. It makes me think of something I've been thinking about pretty regularly lately and not necessarily the theological aspects of it. Mm -hmm. However, the, the relationship, I and it, I found, and I'm sure you probably experienced this as all artists and probably all giving people have, mm -hmm. this phenomenon of people always coming to you mm -hmm. to do something in aid of them, mm -hmm. their pursuits, their goals, their dreams, mm -hmm. which is just fine. However, it needs to, um, we need to teach people about reciprocity. We need to teach people to come to and ask with a give. So if you're coming to someone, mm -hmm asking them to do something for them, you need to be there and ask that person how you can be helpful to them too and the goals that they are trying to move forward. Mm. Otherwise, you are draining the very people who are kind and helpful when you really should be supporting them to continue because if you don't, they'll get sad and they'll give up. And we need them. Mm. We need us. Mm. And is there a way to um, implement that in your life? Certainly. By asking every time or prior to do doing some research and finding out what this person mm -hmm. who you believe can be instrumental to you, what their goals are currently or at the you know, and what you can do to aid them in those goals, or if they don't have anything at the present, to let them know that when the time comes, you are happy to help, especially if you're available. Granted, things happen in life. Right. I mean, there's certain things you can do and certain things you can't do. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, there's always, like, in the digital age that we have now, in the social media age, there's always something you can do to be helpful mm -hmm. and a great many things that don't even take that much effort on your part. Mm -hmm. And so, so basically uh, what you're saying is that you have to make it clear to the people when they come to you that uh, you have expectations 
on how you're going to relate, that it won't all be one way. Yeah, and that's a tricky thing because it's not, you know, you don't want to be confrontational. Confrontation, direct confrontation doesn't really, doesn't really work, doesn't yeah. really help anything. Yeah. But if there is a way to allude to what you're talking about without coming out directly and saying it, and I, I, have, I have an example. Oh, that's perfect. Right? Yeah. So I was talking to, I believe it is Sue at her sanctuary, who's a lovely, giving woman, and she feels overwhelmed with, one, her business, the other parts, and things in her dreams that she wants to accomplish, but she is unable to because she's, like, spread herself too far out for others. Mm. And what I suggested to her was, like, sit down, make a list of all these things you've been giving that are just all these things that you're, you've been giving for others, the mm -hmm. ways in which you are taking from yourself to give in aid of somebody else's dreams, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. I mean, like, I enjoy doing that. She enjoys doing that. I said, do that. And then when the time comes that you go to launch something, mm -hmm. reach out to these people and say, hey, you know, it was really fun, that fundraiser I went to for you. How did that go? Like recap with an experience you had mm -hmm. that was positive in which you were supportive just to remind them that you were there. Mm -hmm. You know, always start with rapport in, in any communication, particularly when you're going to ask for something. Start with rapport. Make sure you acknowledge the person and what they're trying to accomplish, mm -hmm. what they're doing. Remind them of how you were there and you know, directly and indirectly, and then say, listen, I've got this thing going and I could use your help in this specific way. Mm -hmm. And also the more specific you are, the easier it is for the person to actually do it mm -hmm. too. Like don't come with a general, a general ask is too hard. Like people don't know what to do with that or where to put it, mm -hmm. you know, but it's not saying, Hey, I helped you. Now I need your help. I mean, it is saying that, mm -hmm. but it's saying it in like a gentle way because it's also not assuming that the person did it on purpose because, you know, we all have a lot going on in our lives, many different things each individual is trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So it's entirely possible that life has consumed them and they've forgotten about this or there's so much competing for our attention, you know. I try to not to make... I try to make my assumptions based on the fact that life is complicated and we don't know what any other person is facing unless they tell us. Mm -hmm. I like a phrase you just use. Life has consumed them. Has you, have you ever had that experience? Of course. <laughs> well, tell me what that's like. I, I, I'm intrigued by that. Those three words, life has consumed them. Can you give an example of that? Hmm, probably. <laughs> um, I mean, there are different ways in which life consumes me. My projects consume me at times. The big ideas I have that may or may not work. Um, relationships in life have consumed me before in, in a way that it's not the relationship itself that was the problem. It's like my processing of the relationship through my particular trauma. Mm you know, and my particular experience. Hmm. So yes, I, I have a natural tendency when there's a lack of information on something to get bogged down and to ruminate and get consumed in it for a while. Are you speculating because you don't have enough information as to what could be taking place? There's definitely that. But what I've come to realize within like the past year is that the problem isn't what's happening. The problem is my lack of being able to define my needs in that, in that moment, to understand what my limits are and to draw them for myself. It doesn't matter what's happening around, like, or whether I have information. I'm uncomfortable right now, not because of the external things. I'm uncomfortable right now 
because of my lack of clarity and this like murky process processing Mm -hmm. that's becoming easier now that I've recognized what this is. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to know exactly what's going on in the outside world. You have to focus on your internal world and how you're dealing with the limited information you have. Mm -hmm. Well, the discomfort is an, an indication of something, but we're, I'm just saying we in general, we're taught to externalize that like yeah. as something that's happening to us, not something that we're in the midst of that we have, we, we have choice. We have choice at the, the internal level. We don't have choice at the, right. the external level. Right. And I have an example of that too. Uh, I have a friend who is going through a very bad depression. And this is the kind of depression where some days you don't want to get out of bed, okay? And he is going to a therapist, and he's fighting back. And uh, another friend came over, and she said, guess what? He is going to have a performance, and I'm going to go see it. And I said, well, that's great. Um, he's coming out of his shell. So, uh, but as you see, you are here visiting me now, and there's this party going on here for this 86-year-old man. I couldn't really leave here tonight to go to the... Oh, you should have told me. We could have postponed. No, th- this was during the summer. Oh, okay. <laughs> so what I did is I said, hold on a second. And I wrote a note to my friend. I said, now, are you going to be in the crowd or are you going to actually see him and say, good performance, you know? She said, no, I'll see him in person. So I write a note. Sorry, I can't come to your performance. I'm having this party. Friend of mine, 86 years old, he doesn't know how many more summer parties he'll be at. If not for that, I would be there. Put an envelope, give it to her. Say, would you give this to him? A day goes by and I don't hear from my friend. And another day and then another day. So I write and I say, did you get the note at your performance? And he said, what note? Okay, now there's me and there's the outside world. And I can't help but think. So let's say she forgot to give it to him. And then she got home. She put her hand in her pocket. Oh, I forgot to give it to him. Why didn't she email me and say, I didn't give it to him. Yeah. So I, uh, uh, I'm i in a situation where I cannot tell what's happening in the outside world. But to use your analysis, there's something going on inside of me that I can control, namely to uh, now, would you say you let this go, or do you put it on the back burner? Well, what's the the gist of it is that you want your friend to know that you wanted to be there for him, but he... Which I was able to tell him three days later. Yeah, you which know, is... That, well, there was a, a note that was written, Yeah. and you didn't get it. Yeah. Right. So now, what's going on with the friend? <laughs> with the, so I wrote... So my friend, that same yeah. friend, wrote to me and said, I hope you have a happy birthday. Now, this is three months later. <laughs> never mentioned it? Never mentioned huh. it. So she said, I, I hope you have a happy birthday. And she told me something that's happening in her life. Mm-hmm. And then I wrote back and I said, uh, how are you coping with life? I said, do you have some kind of coping mechanism? I said, I think it might be a kind of amnesia where you're blocking things out. Because I can't come up with a reason why you wouldn't have told me that you didn't give him the note. Yeah. (laughs) And she did not even write back from that. So there is this huge amount of mystery in the outside world. Yeah. That I... (laughs) Well, that's a really big way of asking. So what happened with that note? Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, well, one, you're kind of pointing, you're definitely pointing the finger at her when you put it that way, for sure. Uh, Basically, what I'm saying is, is something going on that you're forgetting things? Right. 
But she doesn't know specifically what. Oh, no, you did. You said that. Right. Um, yeah, I sometimes, you know, a lot of times with people, it's ego too, meaning ego, meaning embarrassment. Uh huh. Embarrassment that they've let a friend down. And, you know, that eats at people too. Yeah. But instead of like, I don't know. I mean, like, it's so hard to say because it I'm not is. that person, but it ego, is. ego does an embarrassment yeah plays a huge role in people's inability to handle things head on mm -hmm. you know and i mean you know not head on like head on i mean just directly mm -hmm. and plus you might not have grown up that way there's always that too yeah so that's an example of a mysterious thing in my life that i have to just accept as a mystery yeah but Maybe it will reveal itself someday. I'm hoping. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Please let me know. <laughs> There's a second one that, that appeared, too, in my life. Okay? Also related to my birthday. So you could say this particular birthday I just had was the birthday of mysteries. And it goes like this. Last month, my friend uh, Sanford. I've got to write that down first. Birthday. Of mysteries. That's almost a good title for her documentary. Uh huh. So last month, <laughs> my friend Sanford, he has a very close friend who happens to be his guitar teacher. And he uh, takes a lesson with him once a week on classical guitar. So three weeks ago, his friend said, okay, you ready for your lesson? Hold on while I tune my guitar. You know how to tune a guitar? Mm -hmm. uh, you, well, what you do is you, you, you can do it two ways. You can do it through your ear where you, you keep tightening and loosening the string until it hits a certain frequency and then you, you're okay. It's called tuning it by ear. But there's a new way. You can clip a device to your uh, guitar with a meter ah. and you keep hitting it and you watch the needle and when the needle's in the center you have it okay so he's tuning it by ear and his friend says you don't even own a guitar tuner i do own one but i don't have a battery for it okay so he tunes it by ear which takes a little longer and then they start the lesson another week goes by <laughs> hold on i gotta tune my guitar what about the what about the <laughs> battery for the tuner? I didn't get a chance to go get the battery. <laughs> to is it by ear. So now the third week, the teacher writes in advance and says, go and buy that battery for that tuner. You can get it at any drugstore. <laughs> okay? Now this pushed a button in my friend. Oh, no. Because all throughout his life, he has been like bullied like in high school and things like that. So he's very sensitive when people start to give him orders, mm. you know, like what you should be doing in your life. Yeah. More like, just do it, you know, that kind of thing. So he writes back and he says, uh, you know, this bothered me that the way you're phrasing this and the other things that you've been telling me, it's like you're, you're extending it beyond the lesson and you're giving me these orders uh, and I'm upset and I don't want to have the lesson this week. Let's skip it so I can get my, yeah. my um, calmness back. But his friend wrote back, and said, well, if that's the way you feel, we should stop lessons altogether because you're not really serious on making a success out of yourself. Oh, and, and, <laughs> and, and he says, to laugh, but... furthermore, all the things oh. that I've helped you with in the past uh, are going to amount to nothing unless you oh. overcome this idea that people are trying to boss you around. That's, that's part of your internal flaw see that you you yeah. you feel this way but so yeah. i i said to my friend you know we should definitely talk about this in person oh my birthday's coming up 
why don't we just have a meal together and we could discuss it then? He said, invite these other people, okay? So I said, okay, so we have a, a five person meal set up. And then a birthday arrives. And unexpectedly, all these people decided to throw a surprise party for me, which I did not expect, okay? Okay, so we have the surprise party. That must mean in my mind that the meal is off because you can't say to all the people who've shown up, you stay down here, we're going <laughs> upstairs to eat and don't come up there because right. we don't have enough food for you. Right. Okay. So now's where the mystery starts coming in. One of the people invited to the meal says to me, so when are we gonna eat? I said, I wasn't expecting this. I said, we're just gonna have to eat what the food that the people brought. And she said, well, if I had known this, I would have eaten before I came here. She said, but I'm starving right now. And I said, well, I can't think of a way around this. So we're just gonna have to wing it and see what we can do with what is here. Then <laughs> she wrote back to me the next day and said, that was very rude of you to have pretended that there was a meal when really there was a party <laughs> and bringing me there under false pretenses. <laughs> <laughs> so even this, <laughs> even this fire hasn't reached the mystery level yet. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I wrote back and I said, well, you know, there's this thing, uh, you know, nobody can, um, uh, predict when you're going to have a surprise party and then when you do you have to sort of like accept it yeah that this is what happened and if i had to do it all over again the instant i discovered there was a surprise party i would contact you and say oh, the meal's off be you know and i said i would have done that actually but i didn't even know if you were part in, in on this thing but if i had to do it again i would definitely contact you and say the meal's off so, what she wrote back is the mysterious part. Okay. Uh-oh. <laughs> she wrote back, I cannot believe how mean I am toward you. You're bringing out this mean quality in myself because you're so accepting of circumstances and other people. She says, whereas I am not. She said, you know, I am like the guitar teacher. Like you have to be prepared, you have to do the thing. And she said, I know that I'm gonna keep being mean toward you if we remain friends. And I'm going to hate myself for being that way around you. So it's better that we put some distance between us. <laughs> So that's mysterious to me as well. I have a similar experience. Um, but it, what you're saying is interesting because it indicates like a, a definite level of self-awareness on the part of several of these people. I would say for the guitar teacher, that person does not recognize where their shit comes from and laid more shit. You know, this woman recognizes it. And, and I'll tell you right now, I had a friendship that was pretty much lifelong friendship. And over the course of like three successive years of there being a problem and us kind of breaking apart for a period of time and it happening again and again <laughs> until the third time. And we had had discussions after we'd repaired and I'd said like, here's the issue. And like, I can't do this particular thing with you again because this is the type of thing I've faced in my family. It's not good for me. It doesn't like, doesn't bring out the best in me. It's confusing and problematic for mm -hmm. me. So upon like the third instance of this happening, I said, listen, this just, I don't feel it's neither person's fault, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but this just isn't, <laughs> this just isn't working anymore. We're, re we're repeating the same pattern. Mm -hmm. The fact that that woman had the insight to do that, I think is 
is great. You don't have any say in the matter, of course, and it sucks that like you don't get to hang out with this particular friend who I'm sure you valued for her own her own um, attributes and qualities that you enjoyed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know, like human relationships, so rich and complex. <laughs> you know, like it's going to work with some people. And it's going to work with those people sometimes, but not all the time. It's going to not work at all with other people. Yeah. You know, it's like always in flux. And because everybody has such complex pasts that we know nothing about. And they may not even like know enough about or about how they've been impacted by it or how it informs their their worldview or the choices or, and actions that they take. Mm. Um, it's like a big crapshoot mm-hmm. and, but it's also, it's also very in the manner, like when it comes to, um, when it comes to films and that sort of things, it's something I enjoy. I enjoy films that explore these complexities of interpersonal behavior and interaction mm-hmm. from a distance. At times I find them very funny. Hmm. Have you ever seen Carnage? No. Is it a, is that that the kind of film it is? Yes. About the subtleties of of uh, I'll write that down. <laughs> Carnage, I believe it was a play. Yeah. <clears throat> originally, so it all takes place in one location and it's Jodie Foster, Kate Winslet, Christoph Waltz, Peter C. Riley, four people. And like <laughs> Two separate parents of kids that were in an altercation together. One had been bullied and broke the other kids like jaw or something in retaliation mm-hmm. during some some sort of gang scene that we don't really see much about. But it's these like the discomfort, the shifting dynamics and allegiances and personalities and mm-hmm. like the the dynamics between this couple the dynamics between that couple it's really i mean it's like the the level of emotion hmm. is like nuts and and humorous to me because well i mean i experience emotion too mm-hmm. you know sometimes like you know high levels of emotion which i do not enjoy and recognize are not healthy for me mm-hmm. but which i understand as i grow older have more of an understanding like i know what they are and i know how to take myself away mm-hmm. <laughs> to reflect and figure it out or just have time to myself but that being said yeah i do enjoy <laughs> drama mm. in film in a way you use it almost as an educational tool because it allows you to see things which you might not see if you lived it oh yeah but because you're at a distance you can see with greater clarity yep Absolutely. We're complicated. <laughs> yeah. I watched a movie uh, last night when I was exercising called Reese. And he is a adopted son, but his past is very complicated. He was one of the child soldiers in Africa who were taught to be fighters from the time they were little kids. So they got him when he was 11 years old. And wow. they had to go through all this therapy with him to kind of like uh, reprogram him so that he wasn't a killer. And it turned out he was a brilliant A student who everybody in school liked. But he has a problem in the movie, and that is people expect him to be perfect. And he feels that that's too big of a burden Mm. to put on any individual person to have them every single thing they do has got to be perfect. Uh, so it's got that same dynamic. How do you spell it? R-E-E-S-E, Reese. That's his name. That sounds fascinating. Yeah, that is too much of a burden to put on anyone. Wow. And uh, if you look at, if you watch it, let me know what you think. Okay. A second movie about internal dynamics that I thought was brilliant was called Mouthpiece. Now, this is very interesting. The director 
thought that the main character was too complicated for any one actress to be able to portray. Hmm. So the director did something kind of revolutionary. He said, I'm going to have two people play this one character and you're always going to see them together side by side. When they walk, they're going to walk in unison. When they lay down, they're both going to be facing the same direction, things like that. But they're going to react to things differently. And when they're around another character, that character is only going to see one. <laughs> He's not going to see them both. I like that. Yeah. Um, very different. Yeah. That's, that's somebody that's thinking really cool. outside the box. Yeah. Well, I mean, think about it. I re Okay, now, I remember in my 20s, being in the living room in one of the many apartments I had, you know, at different times, obviously, being among a group of friends and indicating that you know, I'm I'm different with different friends. And someone reacting poorly to that, saying that that was kind of shitty. But I'm not, it's not a conscious thing that just people, you react to different people's personalities, different. They bring out different things. Your, like, shared interests are different. So you, sometimes you communicate differently. So that's, that's very interesting, particularly that, only one of those two representations of that single person would be addressed by any given person that came came to them. That's mm -hmm. really cool. Mm -hmm. I really want to say that's brilliant. Uh, now, yesterday, somebody was here. Alessandra is a drag queen. And what a fascinating conversationalist Alessandra is. Just unbelievable. And he said to me, because he was in his male persona, that having two identities is very healthy because everybody has multiple identities already, but they're only acknowledging one. Like the people who said to you, gee, you know, you act one way around me and a different way around that person. That's wrong. You should act the same way. They want you to have one identity. And the identity that they know. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So kind of like society, we want that one identity that falls within these parameters. And if you're anything else. Yeah. Right. Dot, dot, dot. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, and there yeah, are many things. So you're right. Uh, so, and I, I thought that's very insightful, you know, what you're saying, that people have different identities. And then he said that when he performs as the drag queen, he becomes the drag queen. Everything about him is differently. And he said um, that it's, um, it's a very healthy transformation. So we started talking about living in the world. And he said, now this is interesting. He said, I find life to be very difficult because when I'm around people in my day-to-day -day life, they are pretending who they are like they have a mask on. And that makes me put on a mask. So it's like my artificial self with their artificial self. Hmm. As T.S. Eliot said, I must prepare a face to meet the other faces I will meet. See? Yeah. So it's like, it's like the artificial relates to the artificial. And he says, he said, you know that there's stuff going on behind the mask, but you can't address it. You have to kind of stay on the surface. And he said, that's so difficult. And he said, it wears me down. And he said, I'll be glad when my life is over and I don't have to deal with that anymore. And I thought, well, what you say is true. 
other people have noticed this also. And uh, how does one transcend that? And how does one uh, take off their mask and have the other person take off their mask? It's a challenge. Have you found that to be a challenge in living? Mm -mm. You don't find yourself ever relating to the mask? I don't, I don't know what that is. Uh, somebody is pretending to be a certain way and you're aware of that. Ma, I don't know that I necessarily think of it that way. I just see the person for however they're like presenting themselves at the moment. I don't know if I get that far into it. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I have some questions. I'm certainly not criticizing another person's like point of view. We, you know, each person's point of view is valid, but. In some ways, it I can relate to that partially when he says it's difficult for him because he wants to live fully and he feels impeded by people who aren't living fully, which is a presumption. He doesn't know that just, I mean, but I don't know, one, how long has he known these people? Has he been working with them for 20, 30 years and they've maintained the same you know, mm -hmm. there are a lot of things that are unknown, but I can relate to one aspect in that, you know, like, I've noticed when I've gone to, to Europe in particular, Western and Eastern Europe, not necessarily Italy and the, the warmer climbed cultures, the, and also New York City, it's also particularly it, it may be a, a, an affect of like busy places mm -hmm. where you'll walk down the street and like you won't even look at the person whose face is like mm -hmm. almost hitting your face mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and I find that very exhausting because I like connecting that's not to say that like I don't think anything ill about that person I recognize it for what it is mm -hmm. it's just you you can't it would be in New York City, it would be impossible to smile at everyone. It would drain every bit of energy you have. As it is, New York is completely exhausting, as are other metropolitan centers. However, walking down the street on Elmwood and walking past one individual, and when I go out for walks in my neighborhood, walking past one individual who's walking past you, and even for safety's sake, you should look and acknowledge that other human being. Mm -hmm. But the lack of acknowledgement it used to bother me more when I was younger. Now I'm just like. <laughs> it's the way the world is. It's the way the world is. And that's sad to me. That even the, the tiniest of connection. But again, like, I don't know why I can't judge that person may be dealing with things. That person may have like trauma, social anxiety issues that I know nothing of. So I, I don't know anything. I just like, I just like connecting with people. So it comes back to me. I'm uncomfortable because I like connecting with people mm -hmm. and I'm not getting that back. Mm -hmm. There are times where I have moods too, where I would rather not be looking at people, but I luckily I have the luxury of not having to work for anyone else so I can stay home, mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, that's, it's interesting. I, I don't know about, I don't know about the, you know, certainly I'm more reserved in some situations, not full blown Lucia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there's levels. Yeah, definitely, definitely levels. Mm -hmm. But, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I know I can play different characters, but they're not, necessarily i know in certain business situations and like pitching i feel as though i may have a different kind of posture and a different manner of speaking but that also is like relating to the words that are used the the tone the pace of what's going on and mm -hmm. the conversation anyway so it's really just probably more like adaptive but it's not that it's not part of me. It's also an aspect of me. Mm. It is it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Humans are interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. And I have always been on the more self-reflective side. I, I'm, I'm very curious, like, 
when I have a poor reaction to something, I right away I'm affected by it and recognize that maybe I, I answered too curtly or or something like that. I'm very interested in stepping away and understanding what that is and where that came from. Mm -hmm. That's always been a part of my nature, I think. Mm -hmm. Or at least, you know, maybe since adulthood. I don't know about childhood, whether you get into it that far. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, that living in the world in 2019 is uh, taking a toll on people's mental health? Probably. See, I'm thinking like in terms of climate changing and for if the the for years, environmentalists said, if you want to be safe, when you measure the carbon, don't let it go over 360. Okay? And that was passed. They passed 360 in the 1990s. Uh, this year, when they studied the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, it's up to 415. And they're saying that if it keeps going up, what will happen is it'll start to melt the polar ice caps, which have trapped carbon over the centuries. And when oh, it melts, it's going to release it and it'll go way up, yes. right? And when that happens, you'll start to have uh, crops dying from the heat and uh, drought and things like that. And um, when you have extreme heat, it means there's a lot of evaporation which means you're going to get a lot of rain. You're going to get a lot of snow. And um, knowing that in 2019 can make you think about the future differently. Like... If you think about it. Yeah, exactly. So do you not think about that and try to live your life and keep that as far in the distance as possible? But then, of course, when you watch the news, right now there's fires uncontrolled in Australia because our cold season is their warm season. And, um, and we've never had temperatures this cold in November before in the United States. So you're always being reminded. So you always have to like use some kind of technique to pretend it's not happening. It, still, if you're aware, because... By and large, for most people, and yes, I am generalizing, unless it touches you personally. It's easier to. It's It really doesn't stay in your consciousness. Uh-huh. Yeah. And may or may not even exist. Yeah. So I'm thinking that all this is having an Im impact on people's mental health because it's um, encouraging them toward fantasy and saying, everything's going to be okay. Somebody will come along with some invention that will solve all this. You know, any number of magical things will happen. Or I'm going to believe in an afterlife so that even if I do die, I'm going to keep, my, I will keep going forever. Yet, attendance at, ch at churches it's going down. Drop, is it going up again? I don't know. I don't think it's I don't think it's going up yet. Uh -huh. We'll see if it does because of this. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Or there's the other option which I subscribe to, which is do what you can yeah. to limit your impact, uh -huh. to forestall the damage, even if like you're just one person doing it, at least you're doing it. Right. You know? Yeah. Well, children are really impacted by the things that are happening with the climate. I think they're probably more afraid of it. Greta Thunberg, who yeah. got up at the UN, Amazing. gave that very passionate speech. Yep. Um, so I, when, I talk, when I bring this up to people, like two days ago, I was having a discussion with people, and one of the persons said, well, let's put it this way. If Trump gets elected in 2020... It is the beginning of the end of the human race, which I thought is a very bleak way of putting it. 
it means you know, isn't that something it it's is the beginning of the end of the human race mm. I don't know. <laughs> and i thought wow with that thought in your mind yeah what is how is that going to affect your consciousness going forward like are you going to start drinking more are you going to start uh like uh falling into a depression so i don't ha i don't have any answers to give to you about these things but i'm just noticing them that's what he said no i'm telling you that what right did now. he say uh i was too much in shock to ask him like if you think that way how are you gonna go you know get up and go look at this face <laughs> What does this that is, face this is my reaction to that. My reaction to that comment that he made is very us and U.S. centric, discounting like the m multiple like billions of wild cards there are in the world, like uh -huh. saying that we're at the center and if Trump gets elected, that's the end. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. That's a big I feel for him and like the fear he has. But like there's it's a big eye roll to that one mm -hmm. there's a whole world out there billions of people like come on and it's also saying that like just no one's going to step up and doing anything which i understand why you would say that given the pace of what's been happening in the past few years mm -hmm. and all the shit this man has done to our system like dot 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 you know i get it i get where he's coming from but I guess I take more of like this perspective that my dad always takes. And my dad is like 74, mm -hmm. you know, and so he's been like through many different things where people have sounded alarms about this and that. I remember in the, what was it, the 90s, we were so afraid of Jap Japan taking over the economy because they were, mm -hmm. I mean, um, taking over prominence mm -hmm. on the world stage in terms of like their their auto industry and everything that they were doing and they were coming up right mm -hmm. this is a big fear about japan i remember that so what materialized from that it didn't happen no it didn't mm -hmm. and like many other things that were like so incredibly afraid of and mm -hmm. that are like pumped up to be the next big like frightening thing that don't happen there's no guarantee to happen like again it's the same it's the same thing i always say that i find very irritating no one can tell the future mm. there are too many factors in play mm -hmm. it's almost like a buddhist perspective mm -hmm. change is happening constantly everywhere for you to be able to prognosticate on like a single outcome is impossible mm. so why like why get all worked up about it? Mm -hmm. Keep your eyes open, certainly, and don't like walk around with blindfolds on. But like, but again, it's okay. Like people have their fears, and they come from wherever, and I honor that too. You know, like it's all part of it. Yeah, but no, the world's not going to explode if Trump gets reelected again. Mm. You know, I'm not going to like it. That's for sure. Mm. I'll be a little worried again. Mm, yeah, I don't know. <sighs> we'll see. Did you ever hear the uh, uh, story? Are you well? Are you familiar with the Battle of Austerlitz? The name is familiar, but I don't know the details. Uh, it had to do with uh, Napoleon, and his generals said the scouts just came back, and. Uh, you are facing an army that is twice the size of yours. And we had not predicted this when we came this far. So in light of the circumstances, it wouldn't be a bad idea to retreat and wait for uh, a bigger army. And Napoleon famously said, circumstances, I make circumstances. <laughs> and he figured out a way to deceive the enemy into splitting its forces because there were, he, he made it seem like, well, we're really going to attack from two places when he wasn't going to do that at all. And once they split their forces, he was able to, to win the battle. And I think about that when I 
when I people say there's nothing we can do in light of the circumstances. Yeah. I think of circumstances. I make circumstances. Like we do, we make circumstances. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like a antithesis to their thesis. See? It's creativity. Yeah. There's... <sighs> This is also a Buddhist thing. If you have it in your head that there's going to be a certain outcome and nothing's possible, then like creativity is blocked. All channels for inspiration are blocked. Uh -huh. So yeah, you're not going to find your way out of that. But if you don't allow that to happen, if you don't allow yourself to have fixed notions of things then creativity has a chance inspiration may come or you'll just be open to see the potential for it or open to see this other yeah potential it's like that it's like that what's that physics thing with light the beams of light right like i i don't remember exactly what it is it's I think I do, but you have to just go a little bit farther. Yeah. So where the beam of light is not fixed until you look. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's the uncertainty principle. It's that. Right. Yeah. So it's the same It's the same idea. Yeah. If you've already decided and you're fixed in that notion, that's all it's going to be. Right. But if you haven't decided, there's a lot of potential there still. Right. Uh, the, the experiment you're referring to has to do with a beam of light is shown on a piece of paper. So if you put a piece of paper in front of that with one slit in it, then you look at the, say, the projection screen, and you get a certain pattern, right? But if you put two slits in the thing, you get a like a foggy area. <laughs> so the the way you filter the world affects the outcome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> affects the outcome for you uh yeah well yeah it affects what you see yeah 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 so this being said i'm of course not perfect and have my moments where i forget things these things too and like i said there are times where i may be uncomfortable and i ruminate losing track of this stuff but that's really only because i'm uncomfortable and haven't defined my needs for myself mm -hmm. so once you define your needs then you can go about uh, addressing them yep exactly mm. then you then you can make an action plan Otherwise, if you're just sitting in discomfort, you're just processing. Mm -hmm. And there's there's nothing you can do yet because no ideas are coming. You're just stuck in the space. Mm -hmm. But it's not like the, I'm holding on to a fixed notion in this case. It's the, there's too much information and I feel uncomfortable <laughs> space. Mm. Or not enough information and I feel uncomfortable. Good way of... Uh putting it so not enough information like with my friend who didn't give the note can be uncomfortable and too much information can be uncomfortable because you can't make you, you don't have a chance to make heads or tails out of all this information you're getting i think i made a mistake when i said that i meant the other but like let me think about that oh yeah too much information can be uncomfortable certainly now if we talk about people's mental health being impacted in this day and age because it's the information age too much information and too much too many additional social expectations vis-a-vis -vis social media and the pressure that puts on people uh-huh the desire yeah because uh instagram said they're going to try and experiment uh, they're going to stop letting people have a like button and they want to see if that will improve the quality of people's interactions 
because at the moment people obsess about how many times they get a like and they need to get at least a certain number for them to feel good about themselves. Wow. It's so strange. <laughs> it's strange because it, that makes sense in business when you're like need to track analytics and that sort of thing, but that doesn't make sense for a personal individual that's not trying to sell themselves as a brand. Well, that's a good question. And I've come across this with people. Um, we are bombarded with advertising <clears throat> in which people want to sell us something. Has that filtered into our personal relationships where we're now trying to sell ourselves to other people? So I can recall a person telling me, oh, she said, I said, tell me about your trip to France. And she started listing all the things that she did on her vacation. And I was enjoying hearing about her life experiences. But suddenly her presentation changed from this is what I did to what, this is what you should do. You should go to the Louvre. You should do this. You should do that. You will really <laughs> like it. And I thought, wow, it's like it turned from an infomercial. No, it, it, it turned from a, a documentary into an infomercial. Now it's about me wanting what she experienced. And I was thinking, maybe that's just from being bombarded with advertising. You think this is the way we're supposed to relate to one another. Like we sell each other things. Maybe, maybe. But also, I mean, how well does she know you? Uh, I don't, how do you measure something like that? You mean like, I would say I had. How well do you know each other? Meaning, oh, have oh. you had, how have you, have you related in a substantive fashion more than just superficially? I would say that we met each other and talked maybe before that five times. So it's not that, it's not okay. like a lifelong friendship. Right. So it's not that she knows, she knows the kinds of things that you would really enjoy. Right. See, that makes, that would be different. If she knew the kinds of things you really enjoy. Yeah then maybe it would feel less like a sale. Yeah. And I experienced it a second time when <laughs> I visited my friend who has two cats. And and the cats are of ultimate importance in her life. It's the equivalent of children. So when I'm sitting there talking with her, one of the cats comes by. So she starts petting the cat and talking to the cat. And then the unexpected happened, the commercial thing. Don't you think you would like cats in your life? Wouldn't you want to have this so-and-so? And you come home and they're so-and-so. And I thought, once again, I feel advertising is yeah. infiltrating itself. Weird. That's weird. Huh. Now, there's an interesting court case that has just uh, been presented. The uh, parents from Columbine wanted 